so I think we'll get started. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Michael. I'm from Ant Micro, and I'm going to be talking about a new methodology tool system that we're building. Um, it's had various names, but uh, we kind of call it Visual Scene Designer. And uh, we're going to be showing you some interesting stuff about generating code, generating like system descriptions uh, out of diagrams, and you know, with some interesting uh, connections to Zephyr and other things. So I wanted to start with, uh, you know, kind of uh, the observation that if you're building real systems out there in the field, uh, supporting those, supporting real product families and kind of complicated configurations of products and multi-node systems, this really changes your perspective on development. It's very much different from building something on dev kit. And so, um, if you really want to build things like you know, space satellites or, or cars, you, you run into a whole set of new problems that you wouldn't really encounter if you were just doing uh, work with a dev kit. So that change of perspective kind of uh, gets you to think about things a little bit uh, differently. And uh, of course, um, some of the problems you might encounter, and in fact, uh, you know, we can see that uh, not from a user perspective, but from a vendor perspective, if you have you know, a silicon vendor that has you know, 100 dev kits or 500 dev kits for, for their own silicon, uh, they'll see that in order to work efficiently with this kind of complexity, there's a lot of you know, configurations you have to take into account. There's variability. There's different variants of, of boards. Uh, throughout the life cycle of your product, your bomb might actually change. So you call something board XYZ, but over time, board XYZ actually becomes a different board because you have to use different components because some of those have gone out of, of use and so on. And of, of course, at that scale, you're probably not working alone. You're you know, working in a big team. There's many folks. There's many people geographically disjoined. There's perhaps several companies collaborating. So how do you really tackle this? This is, of course, a very, a very big and important problem. And, and there's no one solution, but I think there's, of course, a very kind of obvious solution um, that I'll kind of talk about in a second. And complicated things further is the fact that, you know, we have a hardware landscape that's already pretty complicated, but in fact, you want it to get more complicated. You want to see more silicon, more chips, more modules, more boards being published and, and in fact we're very happy that this is happening. We're seeing I think we're seeing a renaissance of um, you know new silicon being pushed out by everyone. SD Young devices, NXP, um, Texas Instruments, uh, and everyone's building new uh, types of silicon, uh, higher and higher end, uh, more diversity, you know, the product portfolios are getting more complex with you know people offering ARM Cortex M, ARM Cortex A, um, Risk Five grow. You know, it's, it's a growing market too. So overall, this landscape is really complex, and it's, it's even growing, right? So the problem's kind of getting worse, in a sense. Uh, this is exciting, of course. Like, like we want more hardware. As, as people who work with hardware, we want more of it. But at the same time, of course, picking the right thing and making it work in an ecosystem of your uh, products uh, might be pretty challenging this way. So, in fact, you know, the answer is obvious. We're here at EOSS, and, and uh, you can tackle this with open source. You can kind of make sure that uh, by collaboration, even though the complexity is growing, you're, you're kind of staying uh, in front of a charge. You're staying kind of uh, capable of managing that complexity. But to do that, you need some tools. Of course, one of the things that I'll be talking about today is Zephyr, because Zephyr is uh, uh, a very good answer to, to this complexity. Uh, Zephyr has had this baked in from the very beginning. It is based on configuration. It is based on a methodology that allows you to work with systems in a structured way. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't just throw a bunch of code at you. Uh, there's configurations, there's uh, device trees, there's a lot of depth in Zephyr that will allow you to build your products in a much more structured way. And in fact, with the hardware model 2 that has just been introduced, this gets even better. Because you know, hardware model 2 tries to address this problem of complex hardware, like hardware with you know, two SOCs on it. How do you represent that? Um, and I think it's a step in the right direction. It's, of course, not everything. And still, there's a lot of work in terms of figuring out how to make Zephyr work for advanced hardware with multiple cores and so on. 
and not everything is fully perfectly standardized yet, but it, it is really going in the right direction and Zephyr has been pretty incredible in finding a community-based solution to the problem. It's not a single vendor's idea that's driving this forward. It is a collaboration of a variety of uh, different people. It's, of course, the silicon vendors themselves to a large extent, but it's also different kinds of companies that build products or deliver services. Everyone just tries to figure out a way that serves their own purpose, but by combining those purposes, you can find pretty good solutions. And the hardware world version 2 has actually been a pretty good idea. Uh, so here you can, of course, see some advanced NXP device with some multi-core capabilities, you know, some Cortex-A, Cortex-M. You could run Zephyr on either of these, of course, or you could run Linux plus Zephyr. Uh, so kind of representing this properly and, and making it easy for people to actually do that is, is a challenge. Uh, by the way, the, the migration itself is a nice example of a collaboration. There's been a lot of, of course, hard work and discussions and uh, uh, um, delays and so on. But, but generally speaking, uh, for example, you could see that people actually collaborating across the board, right? So you didn't just have everyone taking care of their own things, to some extent, yes, but you also had people helping each other out. You had Nordic actually kind of spending a lot of time and work to get other people's silicon across the board just to make hardware model to happen, right? So uh, that's a pretty incredible uh, um, way to collaborate around uh, describing hardware, where Yes, everyone has the responsibility for their own stuff, but if someone really wants to make something happen, they can also help other people to make it happen. And in fact, it, it does happen in practice that you, you get this kind of collaboration even between companies that nominally compete, right? So uh, I think Zephyr enables this kind of uh, awesome collaboration even between competitors. And we are also developing a tool called Renode, which gives you the ability to simulate systems. Now, to simulate systems efficiently, uh, of course, you have to model them. That's something you can't avoid. So, you know, you have a device, you, you normally write a driver to make your SPI uh, peripheral run. Uh, on the other side, you'll have to build a model, and that model will have to, you know, describe what this SPI peripheral is doing. Uh, so, there's non negligible work involved in doing that. Uh, having said this, there's a lot of uh, great stuff that comes to your rescue. And it's the same as in Zephyr. You have a driver that might be addressing a certain peripheral. If that certain peripheral is present in a number of different boards that are related, what Zephyr does is it takes configuration, it addresses this via device trees, and you, know, you just instantiate the same driver, perhaps on a different address, perhaps with some configuration options. But generally speaking, you reuse code all across the board in a very strict and efficient and configurable manner. Uh, so that you know you don't duplicate code all the time. So if you're building a BSP for a different board that happens to be similar to another board, has the same SOC or a similar SOC from a similar family, you'll probably just mostly tweak configuration files. Renode does the same. So if you have models for certain peripherals in a SOC, if another SOC uses uh, the same kind of stuff uh, internally, then getting it to work in Renode is going to be very easy. So yeah, our simulator is kind of, uh, of course, an open source tool itself. But it also benefits from other tools that are open source. And one of the things that we've built is called uh, Zephyr Dashboard, which essentially takes all of Zephyr, takes all of the 600-something Zephyr platforms, and runs, uh, like compiles binaries for those platforms in the standard way. Zephyr makes it very easy to kind of just uh, compile a binary across 600 different boards. And then what you do is uh, you run it against Renode, where you just generate the configuration for Renode dynamically from device trees. We have a tool called device tree to REPL that just uh, takes a device tree, generates the Renode description. And you just kind of run one against the other, and you hope for the best. In fact, you don't have to hope for the best. There's 470 targets that we support. So in fact, we cover like 75% of all of Zephyr. And naturally, that does not mean we cover the entire silicon space you know, with all the peripherals and everything. We can run basic demos on 470 boards, and you know, to, there is a lot of complexity involved in actually supporting all of them perfectly. Uh, but there is a great starting point for very, very many boards in simulations. You can just, in fact, this is a public website, it's a public CI where you can just go grab the binaries, you can take a look at the outcomes, and there's, 
a lot of data that we can generate this way because yeah, Zephyr makes this data available in a sense. We transform it, we build it, we run it, we generate traces, we generate a lot of information on top of this, and all of it is you know, open source and then free for everyone to use. And it's a great example of how those tools can reinforce each other, where configurability, if it's baked into both of them, it gets very easy to integrate them. So this is one way that we can kind of handle this complexity. So of course, here we're testing across a range of you know, uh, different devices, different uh, dev kits. But uh, what you might do in your product would rather be you take a lot of different configurations of the same product, you take a lot of different use cases, and you run that in a massive CI. You run a lot of corner cases. You try to figure out what's breaking, what's working. Comet after comet after comet. So this runs after every comet of Zephyr, right? And we have data for Zephyr, like how is the performance of Renode versus Zephyr kind of improving or getting worse? Uh, there's a lot of demos and different kinds of scenarios that we have here, including AI and uh, Rust apps, and so on and so on. So it gives you a lot of insight into Zephyr. Now, interestingly, of course, uh, I'm saying about this interoperability in, uh, of different tools. And in fact, uh, we've seen this in practice already, where because we're running this dashboard, because we're building those tools, uh, we are finding inconsistencies. We are seeing that, well, yeah, this is great, but it could be better if we did it a little bit differently, uh, if we encoded our device trees a little bit differently, or we updated those strings here, uh, our data would be cleaner, nicer, uh, more relevant. And so we go and contribute those changes back to Zephyr. So you will see us making those random pull requests every now and then, just fixing random things in device trees. And if you wonder why we're doing this, well, we're doing this because of that. And, and this is fun because, of course, you discover inconsistencies and uh, you guys are engineers, you know how it works. If you find an inconsistency, you know, someone's wrong on the internet, it's always fun to, uh, to fix something, even if it's, it's a tiny thing. So, you know, you can see how, you know, working with one open source tool actually gets you on a pathway to fixing other open source tools because it's to your benefit. It's not even that you're a nice person, it's just that it happens to benefit you to uh, fix other people's stuff, and much like in the previous example uh, that I mentioned with the hardware model itself. Uh, people just help each other because it's good for them to do so. Now, so, so summing up this part, uh, you know, in the real world, this kind of structure that I talked about, this kind of um, single source of truth approach that I'll call it, uh, it's not just a useful thing, it's essential. At, at a certain scale, like we couldn't ever build the Zephyr dashboard you know, by hand or by some clever hand-generated stuff. We would have to really spend a lot of time to do that and we couldn't maintain that. Instead, we rely a, a lot on automation and the data being correct. So, so we just have to find ways to work differently. We have to find ways which don't involve uh, you know, engineers spending time on uh, tweaking little things here and there. It, it's, it has to be scalable. So the, you know, we use the device tree as a kind of common data model, and that feeds both Zephyr and Renode, and we make sure that those are correct because both our Zephyr work and our Renode work needs this. So we've gone on a quest to find consistency and structure in the hardware landscape. Uh, and that quest has, I think, been going on for three years now. So it's, it's a, a kind of a massive endeavor on our end where we actually did a number of things in sequence. Uh, I told you about the Zephyr dashboard. Uh, but based on top of this, when we saw, okay, we have so much data, we have so many boards that we can run, uh, we thought that, okay, we could perhaps take this data and present it in a different way. So we built a tool called Renodepedia, which is a encyclopedia of hardware. And that Renodepedia is you know, showing you those demos that we run in the CI in a more visual way with traces, with everything. Uh, it was a fun experience and you know, very useful. We, we still use it ourselves as a reference and our clients do too. So uh, Renodepedia was a great step forward. But then we felt that, okay, there's more we can do and we also built something called the Open Hardware Portal. Uh, we do a lot of hardware and open hardware is uh, something that we engage in very, very much. Of course, we build proprietary hardware for our customers, but when we have reference designs, when we have kind of ideas for new boards and so on, we will of course try to make them open source when we can. So we have like dozens of open source designs and we thought we needed a home for them, so we built this hardware portal. We call it Open Hardware Portal, which both hosts an open source component library that we're building. So all of these boards are built in KiCad and we're using Blender to visualize them and then 
our component library is also open source with Blender models and everything. Uh, and we just host it through a portal. And, and again, we're kind of looking at the landscape of devices and chips. And we're like trying to see patterns, trying to categorize them, trying to make sure that we can display them in a one nice and cohesive way. And then the third thing we did was on the top. It's a, it's a tool we call Visual Assistant Designer. So it's, it's been around for a little while, but it actually right now is kind of growing up to be a real tool. So last year we kind of made it, and uh, we kind of made it in a way that you can describe a system visually. Now we're actually kind of combining it with the other efforts. And we're building a system that allows you to visually represent your embedded devices and to do some fun stuff with them. Um, and by fun stuff, I mean serious work, not, not just kind of demos. Um, so like all of these things have been a very good learning experience because all of them required us to work with data and clean up the data and figure out ways to parse you know, the, the massive amounts of, of data. Like to put this into perspective, you know, Zephyr has those 600 boards. Uh, we have thousands of components in our hardware database. Uh, in every sock, there's many peripherals. If you count them all together, again, it becomes like hundreds or, or thousands, perhaps, because there's like hundreds of SOCs, thousands of IPs in those SOCs. So overall, it's a massive scale. And, and figuring that out has been a really challenging thing, but also very rewarding. And we haven't only focused on Zephyr. So over time, we realized that, yeah, Zephyr is a great starting point. It's a very tidy and nice operating system with a lot of data in it. But of course, if you want to go and target the entire ecosystem, you need to also use U-Boot and Linux, and perhaps some data from vendors, and perhaps a platform I.O. You know, there's different places on the internet where you can find structured information about hardware, uh, the challenges in pooling this data together, and actually making it sensible. But we're trying to kind of make that work. So what we're essentially building right now is a system to describe and manage entire multi-device systems you're building. So I'm, I'm giving an example here of an open source hardware setup that we're building. This is a uh, GPU cluster that consists of you know, mechanics and, and a bunch of boards and a PSU to power it and so on. And all of these can be represented in this tool. And uh, you know, for kind of every piece, you can drill down, go into the actual components, see what's there, and see what software is running there, and so on. So this is a pretty massive, of course, piece of hardware. Uh, but you could do this on different scales. Like, of course, it doesn't have to be a GPU cluster. It could be a smartwatch. It could be a, uh, any kind of device that you're running, a medical device, uh, a satellite that I showed before. Uh, the importance is in the connections. Like, you, you, know, you create a connected database of whatever goes into your device. And in fact, all of this is based on open source data. Like we have uh, you know, this, this database of components, we have the Zephyr data, and uh, we are looking for a way, we're building a way to expose that data in a nicer way. You remember Renodepedia, this is kind of similar, but much broader in, in, in its kind of ambition. Uh, we're trying to present this data in a way where you can you know, search things and kind of uh, explore what kind of SOCs are there on the market, what kind of cores they are inside, uh, what kind of I.O. they have, and so on. Uh, and, and the interrelations between those elements are very important for us. Uh, as a slight detour, if you look at different kinds of devices on the market, for example, you will find that uh, there, there's an Ethernet controller, for example, that you find on a RISC-V board, the Polo of SOC. The same Ethernet will be found on, for example, a Atmel Cortex-M7. And the same uh, peripheral is going to be found on an upscale plus, which is a Cortex-A device from, from AMD Xilinx. So, so a very broad range of hardware can actually share common components. And it's not very visible normally until you start working with this data and uh, until you realize that there is so much IP reuse going on between the silicon vendors. There's so much structure in this. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to work with. And one of the things we want to enable is like, you know, when you're kind of making choices, like, hmm, what SOC am I going to try to use and so on, you can filter by course, I.O., and just make your design decisions this way. Uh, and of course, like, like before in Renaldpedia, you can have those demos that we kind of, we have a CI that builds demos for all these boards that we have Zephyr running on, and then those demos, you can just look at them, you can look at the results, you can reproduce them fully, this is all like open data. So you can get into any of these data demo, and there's just both Zephyr and U-Boot now. Uh, so you can grab the relevant binaries. You can look at the UART logs. You can look, look at the trace outputs. Uh, and it's a great starting point, right? Because if you took a dev board 
you could basically grab a binary from here and just run it, and it should work. We actually do it ourselves. We kind of use this resource ourselves internally uh, when we want to get started quickly. But existing boards is, are kind of boring, right? Like, you, you actually want to build things that are new. Uh, so I'll, I'll get there. So we, for example, develop hardware for our customers, for ourselves. And for this hardware, we typically have some more data. Like, we have data about uh, their design. And we can, for, for all those open boards, we can actually generate 3D renders. We can actually generate like hot areas where you click on a component, you go to that component. And then you can also generate data about you know, the stack up of the board. You can preview the schematics online. There's a lot of depth there that you can explore. And of course, we don't need all this data. Like If you're missing some of this data, then you just don't get some of the features. But if you have this data, and very often you know, we don't actually need the actual design data, uh, for most of these things. Uh, it's enough for like production Gerbers and placement files. Uh, so this is pretty cool. And one of the other things that you can do if you have this ability to describe a system in a, a co coherent way, you can generate software bombs, you can generate hardware bombs. Uh, and uh, of course, our software bombs is something that Zephyr does. So we're kind of leveraging the capability of Zephyr. Hardware bombs is actually something that's being standardized now in a HBOM work group that's led by Kate Stewart. Uh, so kudos to, 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 to her and leading that group, uh, where as soon as a standard emerges for doing this, because we don't have a consistent standard out there for telling people what just hardware looks like, as soon as one emerges and we're helping define it, uh, we can actually use this information to generate whatever you need, right? Because we know what the system is built from. We have all the components and so on. So now getting to the visual designer itself, uh, you know, if you want to represent that kind of structure, of course you can just write it in a file, right? But um, we felt that it's, it, there has to be a better way, or at least another way that you can augment your work. And we came up with this diagramming-based solution where you, you have a diagram that basically describes the connections. It's not a schematic, right? It is a block diagram. So it operates on the level of I.O., um, like SPI, like I2C, like PCI Express, or, or connectors that you connect physically. So uh, the, this actually presents this GPU cluster. Um, so there's eight different GPU uh, units and the main board. Uh, it's a pretty nice structure because, of course, it's very uh, uh, logical, uh, you just want to run eight GPUs together and, and coordinate between them. Uh, so you can describe your device this way, and that gives you a lot of interesting capabilities. Um, so of course, um, it gets interesting, especially as you uh, you know take different elements that are active, right? If you take SOCs, if you take sensors, if you take actuators, you can turn them into boards where you run software. And then, uh, of course, it's kind of funny where when you're building a new board, uh, the, the delta T between conceptualizing the board and getting something working can be very long. It's, you both have to develop the hardware, and then once you have the hardware, you still have to develop the software, and it might be a while before you see any result. And we want to change that, right? And we want to change that not just for dev boards, we want to change that for uh, any kind of custom boards. So in fact, what we do is, based on the structured device tree data that uh, Zephyr has, uh, we parse that, we kind of analyze that, and we can generate board files, device trees, and test binaries. And when you do that, you realize that, oh, I could actually have a test binary for anything. Uh, of course, having some assumptions in place and so on, but generally speaking, Zephyr is very flexible in explaining how things should be connected. So uh, with some you know, clever heuristics, you can get very good coverage of different kinds of systems. And we can generate binaries for you know, quite a lot of different SOCs connected to different sensors, uh, and it just works. And when I say it just works, it's because you can then take those binaries and you can actually run them in simulation. Because as you remember, if we have a device tree, we can also generate a simulation file. So you put those two together, you get a full feedback loop. And um, with that, I will actually transition to a demo. I hope that works with this screen setup that I have now. Um, but I, I did want to kind of show you uh, how this would work uh, in practice. I just need to fire up something in my terminal, or I'll start with the system itself. So, yeah, let's see how that works. It's going to be fun clicking things on this other screen, but. 
I'll take my chances. Or will I? Yeah, that was the wrong button. So. Button. Okay, so this is the system itself. It's unfortunately very bright in here, so I hope you can see something. Um, basically, we have all those levels I talked about, right? This is a web page that pulls it all together. Uh, of course, you have the device level, and then you have the GPU cluster. You see the GPU cluster, it has all those things in it. And you click one of the boards, you kind of get into that particular board. Because we have the 3D assets here, we can actually flip it. So uh, it flips. It's an actual animation we generate out of Blender. Uh, this one is not very interesting because it has no active components on it. But if we go to boards, uh, for all of these boards, of course, we have some Zephyr demos. But there's one that I have a special demo for. Uh, and this is this entire flow. So this is an environmental sensor we built with an ST chip on it and some sensors, of course. And for this one, we have a block diagram that we created. And our aim is to actually generate those diagrams automatically as well for all of the Zephyr boards. Uh, but for this one, we kind of drew it by hand. And, uh, uh, and this diagram is special in that it isn't just a drawing, right? It isn't something that uh, you, you just look at and think, oh, uh, my system is very nice. Let me look at it. Uh, you can click edit this diagram here. Again, sorry for lack of visibility. And you will open an editable version of this, right? So you can take those components there on the left-hand side. You have like displays, I.O., sensors, you name it. And uh, you can connect them up together. And this, those connections are actually meaningful. So you know, this is not just randomly connecting things in, in Draw.io or, or in Google Draw. Uh, this is uh, connecting things with the understanding that a GPIO can only be connected to a GPIO and so on. So there's a specification driving this uh, that dictates what components are available and what things uh, can be connected to each other. And so we have this diagram. And it's, it's looking pretty nice, but let's do something fun with it. Um, so let me just run the back end here. The back end will be running on my computer. But you could, of course, run it in the cloud. And now we can actually press the play button. And you can see that I pressed play, and we have a backend that just builds the Zephyr application. And I didn't have any board files or anything else on my computer for this before. So I only have the diagram, and I only have knowledge of how Zephyr works. And from that diagram, I generate the device tree and board file. Of course, then the binary compiles. And once, uh, once it gets compiled, uh, it should start simulating. Let me see. Can't see very well on the screen. Okay, so starting the simulation. And I'll have to close the terminal just to show you. But here we have an LED that's blinking. And this is the real binary running in simulation in Renode. And this binary actually connects back up to Renode, Renode I mean, back up to the front end. And we have the LED really blinking. And there's some temperature sensors getting temperature readings. You can see the UART output here. So there's a Zephyr console. Uh, we see the LED state. We see you know, 20 degrees being uh, represented here. And we could actually, I mean, I'll, I'll try to be uh, uh, a little bit kind of creative here. So yeah, the problem with my setup here is that I don't see it very far into this. I'll actually move this a little bit closer to me. I can do that. It's interactive. Uh, and there you have a temperature, right? So we can just edit this, and perhaps we, I don't know how much can we can. OK, let's make it 1. So hopefully, I made 1 degree. No, I, I made it 19, I think. OK. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I just took it down a notch. So now we have 19 degrees. We started with 20. Now we have 19, and so on and so on. You can actually go and modify the diagram. So of course, you'll have to stop the simulation for that. So I will kind of go and, and stop the simulation uh, by kind of clicking here. And now I can grab an LED. Let's take this one. And this LED, uh, you know, it has a GPIO connection. I can move it to the other side here. And I grab the GPIO connection. Oh, sorry, this is overlapping here. So let's 
the GPA connection. I can only connect to GPAOs. The, the, the only green ones are here are, are the GPAOs here. Oh, okay. And now I hope it works. <laughs> so now I have another uh, LED, right? Let's regenerate that. It'll take a while, of course. Yeah, so here you go. So if we, if we minimize this, you'll see that uh, both of the, uh, come on. Okay, uh, you know what? It's, it's very hard to click here. Yeah, okay, so both of, of those LEDs are blinking now. And this is being regenerated live, right? So you can, of course, like take away sensors, add sensors, change stuff as you wish. So uh, that's, the demo, of course, like there's much more depth here. You can explore the database and so on. Uh, but I think hopefully it kind of visualizes to you uh, how it's all connected and how it's relevant. And in fact, one of the things you have to understand is that we can also do this for multi-node systems. We can do this for complex systems that run multiple binaries on them. Um, out of necessity, the demo isn't much more complicated than this, but you could just scale it up to more boards. You could connect boards over CAN or uh, and, and all of that is supported in Renode. And the major challenge that we're facing is how do we represent this graphically, right? We can make it happen on the command line, and we're trying to give people a tool that will also allow them to, to do this, uh, uh, you know, uh, graphically. So I'll close this now, and I'll try to return to my slides, which I managed to do, I think. Uh, and so you can actually hear more about the specifics and you know, the details of how it works in another session that comes right after mine, uh, which is going to be showing this, but not in the context of an STM board, but in the context of a pretty complex multi-core FPGA-enabled device. My colleague will be kind of getting into the details of how that works and why are we doing it for FPGA-based uh, RISC-V devices and so on. So, so you can see that if you're interested about future plans, and that's, that'll be kind of very quickly to wrap up. First of all, uh, we need to release this publicly, so the system that we're building is kind of uh, very new, so it hasn't been released. It will be released in the next few weeks, and in fact, the, the entire flow is open source, right? So if you want to reproduce that, there's a link here. It's not very visible, but you'll get the presentation later, and you can reproduce this. Uh, and, and the portal itself, the tool that we're showing here, is going to be uh, released and, 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 and public. So it's just a matter of a few weeks, I guess. We also want to have like user profiles where we can kind of save data and have private projects and templates and stuff like that to enable people to not only just work with generic boards or perhaps play around and, and finish and go home, but more like persist their data and, and try to build real systems. And of course, we'll be using it internally too ourselves to build our customer projects. And generally speaking, we want to enable you to like express your system and then get our help to build it, right? Either on the hardware side or software side, perhaps build simulation, perhaps build Zephyr or like an over the update system, like the sky's the limit. We want to make sure that you can represent your system properly so that once we know what it's comprised of, it gets easier to uh, discuss what can be done with it. And with that, I'll leave some minutes for questions. Thank you very much. So um, thanks for doing that. This is super interesting, especially from a, a sort of a lens of CI and continuous builds. And um, that alone makes it worth it. But so. Because it's cross-platform in software, cross-platform in hardware, um, what's the complexity behind the scenes? How brittle is this right now? Or can I pick it up and run with it today? That's a very good question. And uh, you know, we don't really know how brittle it is because we haven't tested it so thoroughly as we'd like. I think that if you just took it and run with it today, you'd definitely run into rough edges. Uh, this is mostly because um, when we parse the device tree data and so on, there's still a lot of inconsistency and, and th things to figure out. There is no unsolvable problems there, though. Like, we don't believe this fundamentally should be brit brittle long term. It's, it's a matter of it being new and, and, you know, kind of us building it up as we go and, and being excited about it, of course. We try to present it at an early stage, right? So uh, definitely I wouldn't recommend it to you. I mean, grab the repo, try it out for yourself. 
but don't use it for a production system yet, right? We will be actually the party that starts using it for the production systems, just so that we can kind of continue sharing this methodology with others uh, as soon as we, uh, you know, we know it's safe to use it without, you know, our supervision. Uh, so I guess definitely there's some brittleness, uh, I'm sure, uh, but most of it is just, you know, we're parsing data with Python most of the time and generating things. And the better the source data becomes, the less brittle our algorithms become. And uh, typically it's a lot of just string parsing really and uh, you know, device tree um, compatible strings. You know, uh, They used to be kind of here and there, but they're much more precise today. The hardware model version two is helping. Uh, so it's all converging in the right direction. But uh, as for like, is it production ready? Probably not. Uh, uh, but we'll be the first to tell you when it's, you know, okay, it's production ready, you should do it. Right now our focus is release this portal <laughs> so that people can actually, uh, because you can experience it from a command line today, uh, but that, that's not as much, like that's not as awesome as we'd like, right? What we want here is, you know, you, you fire up the portal, you wire up Vnodes to the portal by just running a command line, you know, command. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, and then you, you can play around with different things. And, and only then you actually expose all the interesting things you could do, which are kind of the same that you could do with a command line, but it's just that the, the portal aspect, the exploration aspect, gives it a whole new uh, dimension. And I think, of course, uncovers a whole new kind of worms and set of problems, but that's good. We want to solve those problems. One, one follow-up. Um, you also mentioned that because of the common IP blocks used across many different parts, um, you can sort of get a bigger bang for buck. I work in custom silicon. How would I go about plugging my IP block into this system? That is an excellent question. So in fact, one of the other goals that I didn't dare to mention is silicon development. So we work with open source tooling for silicon development, open source IP, and generally we do help silicon companies build chips. And we do want this to be integrated into the, the portal. We just chose, uh, we pick our battles, right? So boards and systems, um, are kind of a different use case, similar because it's all, again, interconnected and so on. So we have the encyclopedic aspect of, you know, IPs and SOCs and so on. We don't yet have, like, the design capability where you go into a SOC and, I mean, we have it internally, right? We have a proof of concept, we have a lot of work in that field, but how do we plug it back into this publicly available system? It's just a lot of work, but we definitely want to do it. We're involved in uh, things like Calypto Root of Trust. We're involved in Open Titan, Open Secura. You know, we're involved in a bunch of open silicon projects, which come with a lot of open source IP. Uh, and of course, there's also proprietary IP that's very interesting that you, know, you can kind of put those both together and perhaps build a chip out of this. So we definitely want to enable that use case. It's just not going to be the first on the roadmap. Uh, but you know, it, it kind of depends who's asking as well, because like, if we have people that say, oh, this is awesome, we, have to, we totally have to enable this use case today, uh, we're flexible to doing that. It's just a matter of uh, picking your battles and like, gauging the interest. Like, uh, where do we see the most people getting excited? And then probably this work will go uh, whatever direction we see is, is being useful. Of course, some of it is just driven by our own projects. So, you know, uh, if we have a lot of like, product development projects, then perhaps the product development side of things will develop faster. Uh, versus if we have a lot of silicon projects going on, uh, suddenly you'll see features popping up related to silicon design because we, we kind of tend to build tools that we use ourselves. A Reno originated, for example, as an internal tool that we only open sourced after a few years when we realized it's useful in the broader context. So you will see a lot of our stuff when it's popping, like when you see some open source releases from Ant Micro, it's typically a customer that's driving them, uh, or, or, or at least a use case that targets a group of customers. Thank you. Some more question? One question from my part. Um, so you're generating device tree, uh, so I guess that it means that you're generating all the pin control, clocks, and so on, clock configuration, and so on, yes? Yeah, yep. of course, and, and I think there's quite a lot of work to be done in that space especially. So we'd, of course, generate some default values, and uh, how do you actually make it easy to graphically configure like stuff like pin control is one challenge that we have to tackle. So good point. Uh, and, uh, 
Right now, we would just generate you know whatever is the default. Uh, but uh, I assume there's you know some things that people might want to tweak in that regard. And we've already talked about that. We already have plans how to do it. It's just a matter of implementing this. Thanks. No question. Okay. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Michael.